Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. The media alongside our state is one of the most important institutions in any society. The media act as a watchdog and an important counterbalance to the state, as well as holding up a mirror to society. As South Africa approaches its 20th anniversary as a democracy, and as we sadly but officially enter a post-Mandela era, every important institution in this country is up for review and scrutiny. It's an important time for us to reflect on what we have achieved and not achieved as a country together, and to consider what the future holds in store for us. How has the media embraced its role in post-apartheid South Africa? Helping us to make sense of this question is Professor Jane Duncan. Jane is Highway Africa Chair of Media and Information Society at the School of Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes University. She also has a regular column here at Saxes. Welcome to Saxes, Jane. Thank you very much, Fazila. Jane, we're going to spend time talking more generally about how the media has embraced um, its role in post-apartheid South Africa. But what I wanted to talk to you about this morning, particularly as it's just been days since we lost President Mandela, I'd like you to reflect a little bit for us this morning on your thoughts on how the media has covered President Mandela's death. Well, I think obviously there's been a huge outpouring um, of sympathy um, for the family, which I think is exceedingly important at this stage. And I think also as a country as well, we need time to pause and reflect um, on what it means to actually start to function in a post-Mandela era. era. So I think that um, there's been a, a lot of media reflection up to this point focusing on those issues, but a lot of the media reporting I think has really been focusing on the legacy um, of, the, of the individual. And often in a way I think that um, is not exactly a balanced reflection um, of the true legacy of the Mandela era. And the legacy I think of the Mandela era is, is quite mixed. Um, the man was a giant um, in terms of the, um, the courage and perseverance um, that he showed um, in the struggle against apartheid. Um, but I think he also pre presided over a transitional period and over the first post-apartheid administration that I think um, uh, sowed the seeds of what is quite a, a, a mixed, troubling um, post-apartheid picture. Um, that we have at the moment. Um, we have a country that is still um, highly unequal, one of the most unequal countries in, in the world. Um, there have been many um, uh, uh, successes um, over this period. The rolling out of the social grants, for instance, has been a major success. Um, but structural unemployment still continues to bedevil the country. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that the transition that took place in the country that um, Nelson Mandela presided over took place at a time when the balance of forces globally I think didn't favour liberation movements and as a result of that we saw many, many liberation movements um, being driven into negotiated settlements in very, part, very um, many parts of the world that weren't necessarily um, entirely advantageous to, um, to, to progressive forces. I think that there are um, a number of um, historians who've documented very ably um, the, 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 the contradictions of the negotiated settlement um, that we went through, um, such as Sampito Blanche, for instance, who's documented how there was a parallel series of negotiations with the economic um, uh, powers um, in the country, parallel to the political negotiations that led to a series of economic compromises um, that I think continue to shape um, the kind of political economy that we've got in the country at the moment. Um, so I think this is also part of Mandela's legacy as well. And perhaps in time, um, we'll come to be able to develop media spaces that will enable to, to, um, to, to allow us to reflect, um, I think, in a more considered fashion about where we are um, as a country at the moment. But certainly, I don't see sufficient um, reflection, um, really um, um, a critical reflection um, about where we are at the moment and the contribution, both good and bad, um, of Nelson Mandela and the, the, the Mandela administration towards that. Let's get to the specifics of the media in general in South Africa. 
About 10 weeks ago, the Print and Digital Media Transformation Task Team released a report charging that the media industry in South Africa is failing to transform itself. One of the critiques of the report was that while newsrooms are becoming more integrated, the boardrooms in the media still remain pale and male. Can you comment specifically on this particular issue with respect to the media and what it means for how the media reflects our society, but also talk more generally about media transformation in South Africa? Well, my understanding of media transformation is that we can say that the media is sufficiently transformed when it accurately represents the society in which it operates, not only in terms of its product, but also in terms of ownership and staffing and audience as well. Um, I think once we have transformation on all those levels, we can start to talk about a meaningful transformation um, in the media. Now, I think what the PMDTT report did show up was that transformation has been uneven. Um, but also I think what is quite um, problematic about the PMDDT report is that it tended to equate um, transformation with racial transformation. Now racial transformation is a necessary but not sufficient um, condition for the kind of more thoroughgoing transformation that I just mentioned earlier. I think it's important because if demographically the media is out of step with broader society, then I think inevitably it's going to um, create a situation where people are going to look askance at the media. It creates space for uh, people to point at the media and to say um, that because the media is insufficiently representative, it doesn't understand the society in which it operates. Um, it possibly is operating according to um, a certain money minority agendas because of that. Um, so I think it can serve to delegitimise um, the media if um, it's insufficiently um, representative demographically um, of society. And that's not only in relation to newsrooms, but also in relation to boardrooms as well. Um, I think that the, the, the optics are important when it comes to boardroom um, transformation. Um, if we have a fairly well transformed newsroom, but the management decisions um, are being taken by pre predominantly white boards, um, then inevitably um, it's, it's going to create problems um, for the credibility, for the legit legitimacy um, of that media organisation. Let's talk a little bit about media ownership and its um, implications for editorial content. Just this weekend we heard that Cape Times editor Alida Danois has been removed from her post by her newspaper's group's controlling shareholder Second Jalo after she published an article alleging that a Second Jalo subsidiary had fraudulently acquired a government contract. Reports say that Danois was informed by Second Jalo Consortium Executive Chairperson Iqbal survey of her removal on Friday. Can you comment on this specific case and the issue of ownership and editorial content more generally in relation to the media? And I mean, when you, when you answer this question, I, I don't think the issue of the SABC is off the table as well in terms of who controls our public board broadcaster. So if you would engage with that as well. well. I think specifically in relation to the Cape Times case, we obviously don't know what precipitated um, the removal of Elite Danois. It looks suspicious though. Um, you know, it's difficult not to arrive at the conclusion that there was management interference in relation to a number of articles that were, I think, extremely um, critical um, of, of Second Jala, but we obviously can't state that, state that conclusively yet. I would hope that if um, uh, Second Jalo had issues um, with the Cape Times' um, reporting um, on, the, um, on, on, on the alleged um, corruption in, 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 in the tender, um, then I think that it would have been appropriate um, for Second Jalo to take the matter to the press ombudsman and to lay a complaint there. But to start getting heavy-handed and to send um, lawyers, a lawyer's letter um, to the editorial staff um, and uh, to remove the editor in these very dubious, um, I think, conditions, um, I think certainly does create the impression that there's been undue um, management pressure on, on, on editorial. Um, but 
I think that th there was always a danger when it came to um, a transformation of the press because I think it's become fairly evident um, that the press on a number of levels is insufficiently transformed. Um, newsrooms are certainly um, very transformed. Um, but when it comes to um, management structures and ownership, um, there's insufficient um, uh, transformation that's taken place on those levels. And I think that the press really has been damned, would have been damned um, if it didn't transform, but it potentially could be damned if it did transform. And what I mean by that is that if it didn't transform, then inevitably that would be used in order to um, deal it continue to delegitimise the press and I think that the ANC has done that very successfully. Um, they've pointed fingers at the press and said that because of the lack of transformation in the press um, therefore um, they are pursuing an anti-ANC agenda, they're out of touch with majority opinion and they are um, very um, uh, market fundamentalist and neoliberal in their, in their outlook. Um, so those kinds of arguments would continue if, uh, to be made um, about the press. But if they didn't um, transform, then I think inevitably um, um, the, um, their credibility um, would have been damaged. Um, but if they did transform, it, the, the, the possibility was always there that um, um, empowerment groups that were linked to the ruling party or even a faction of the ruling party um, could take control of chunks of the press. Um, and I think this is why many people, I think, have been concerned um, about the second Jalu buyover of independent newspapers. Um, it is um, undeniable that um, the company needed to come home and that a local owner needed to buy um, the, um, the, 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 the newspaper group. Um, but the manner in which um, the group has been bought out, the lack of transparency um, when the initial sale took place, and now this particular incident, I think sounds even louder alarm bells um, about the nature of the owner that independent newspaper has at the moment, and the extent to which that owner is actually independent um, of, the, um, of, 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 of the current ruling elite um, of, of the day. Also having said that, I think we need to look at um, what's happening in our media system more broadly because it seems like that there are larger and larger chunks of the media system that are becoming aligned um, to the ruling elite um, and, and um, the, the ruling faction of the ruling party. Um, and one has to just think um, uh, about, the, um, about the SABC um, in order to see um, um, the extent um, to which political control has that actually manifested itself in the um, in the in the media system. Um, the three top management um, officials um, of the SABC, the chief operating officer, the chief financial officer, um, and the chief executive officer, are all political appointments, um, and that should worry us particularly because the chief executive officer is also the editor in chief of the SABC. Um, also recently the Chief Operating Officer has been put in charge of news and current affairs at the SABC. So what that means is that there is a direct line that can be drawn um, between um, the Minister of Communications on the one hand and the editorial content of the SABC on the other and that obviously lends itself to greater political control of the SABC. The fact that we've seen a drift towards um, um, uh, more positive news, uh, a quota even, 70% 70, 70 positive news. The so-called sunshine, sunshine news. Sun, so-called sunshine news. I think is all an indication of the fact that there is a drift um, within our media system um, towards greater either direct or indirect um, government control. And that should concern us because given the kind of society that we are at the moment and the huge challenges that we face given the growing social contradictions in the country that are giving rise to, um, um, I think, protests in many parts of the country, given what happened in Marikana, um, for instance, in last year. Uh, last year, I think it became, it's becoming increasingly evident um, that um, uh, social contradictions are growing um, and because of that, I think the, the temptation is there um, for government to curtail um, what are increasingly loud and critical voices, including in the media. Um, so this drift towards greater state control, I think, should really worry us. But also the media system, I think, is to an extent caught between a rock and a hard place. 
the rock being greater state control and the, 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 the hard place being greater corporate control of the media. We still have a highly consolidated um, uh, media system. Um, we can see it particularly in the press, where one large group um, dominates the press, Media 24, uh, followed by four smaller groups. Um, and I think that that's unhealthy because I think it does reduce inevitably the diversity of voices in society. Um, and I think what we do have in the country is um, that the nature of the media transformation that has taken place has given rise to a highly unequal media system. The kind of social inequalities that we see in broader society, I think, reproduce themselves in and through the media. And we can also see um, those, those inequalities structuring how the, 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 the post-apartheid media system um, has come into being. Um, you could almost characterize it as being like a funnel where the higher up the funnel you go, the, 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 the greater the, um, plurality of media there is, um, and the more people in upper income groups have access to this greater plurality of media. I think um, upper income groups are very well served by a plurality of media, not necessarily by diversity of media. But the further down the funnel we go, um, I think the, the, the less poor and working class media um, focused media there is and as a result I think the less voice there is of poor and working class and unemployed people um, in the media and I think that that is an unsatisfactory situation for us to be in 20 years into a democracy. I think it inevitably leads to a society where we are really unable to see ourselves um, in all our complexity um, and with all our problems. Um, I think it leads to an uneven um, public sphere, an elite public sphere, in fact, um, where your ability to have voice in the public sphere is determined largely by money and wealth. And I think inevitably we're not going to be able to um, he uh, address head on our most pressing problems as a society if we're unable to see ourselves accurately and because of that um, we are unable to have the kind of hard conversations that we need to have to resolve our most pressing problems. Jane Duncan, thank you very much for joining us at Saxis. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Fazila. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. If you're looking for more social justice analysis, you can get that at our website at saxis.org.za.